In some countries, they call them sheep stealers. And then they're frightening because they're found around dead bodies. And more, it's really colorful, red. And people thought that it ripped out the throats of its victims and covered itself in blood. So it's quite diabolical. It's clearing a bit, you see. Is it further up or down? You see that big stone there? It's round. Yeah. Which is near the big icefall in winter. Yeah. You've got a first lump of rock. Yeah. He's in the second lump of rock. Oh, yeah. The one which goes up and opens so up. So it's not far from here? Not far. So there's no one in the nest. I'm going to look at the roosts, too. There's no one on the roosts, but anyway, they're roosts that are used when there are chicks in the nest. On the other hand, the nest has changed a bit. Here we can see it very well. So, Milu, we've got good visibility, so if they come on site, we'll see them. On the other hand, I don't know if you managed to have a look when you came up just now, but the space has been really quite reworked. They've remade a central cup with new wood. It's quite impressive. OK, well, as for me, I'm still in this crap, but it's clearing a bit up above. Yes, yes, it's getting lighter up there. So you can imagine, Noah, that in Upper Savoy, in Switzerland, in Italy, in the south, Mercantour and the Ekrins National Park, in Germany, in Austria, there are people doing what we're doing at the moment. Oh, yeah? Yeah, everyone. In the field from 10 until 3. It's quite amazing, eh? It's called the International Search for Bearded Vultures. So here what's quite difficult is that these are adults with no special marks on their plumage. They have some special features, but you can only see them very, very close up and in good conditions. So when there's one molting, it's much easier. You can see a hole in the wing if you're looking properly, or a hole in the tail. Ah, spring with the sky behind it. So here we're in the valley, the Valley of Roswell, which is the valley occupied by the Lamagayas since 2003, with a nest area that's been occupied for six years in a row. Here you are, those are eagles there. So there's a young eagle which is going to pass close to the nest area. And there's a lamagaya up there. So this too, this doesn't happen very often. When the lamagayas start their reproductive season, they have a slight tendency to not put up with the eagles near their cliff faces. So here what is quite astonishing is that since this morning, obviously the eagles are doing as they please on the face. There's no urge to chase them away. But usually, the closer you get to the laying date, the more actively they defend their territory.
Here we're already sheltered, that's important. We're sheltering in the winter refuge of Grenéron. Well, we're going to spend the night here. And tomorrow morning, oh well, we'll get up and we'll contact the other teams that are scattered around everywhere in Upper Savoy. The objective is to do the census of the population of Lamagayas at a single point in time. This also depends on the weather conditions which aren't always on our side, but at the moment we're quite confident about tomorrow. Here the interest of doing it at this period is that we're getting close to the nesting time, so we may discover new things. We're going to take a look over the southeast cliffs in the hope that they're going around there and then that they'll come and give us a little visit. We're not completely out of luck. We've already had a visit. You can see down there some chamois, especially a male which spent the afternoon with us. So we've a rich session of chamois sightings. On the other hand, for birds, it's been a lot poorer. All the same, we saw at the end of the protocol an eagle about three o'clock just below, which went and landed on the spruce. Two minutes later, we glimpsed an adult lemagaya. We saw it circle a bit above, and then it vanished into the forest. We were hoping all afternoon that it had come back for a visit. The sunshine's been all you could have asked for, but the Lamagaya is still just a wish. What's interesting, all the same, and a good sign, is that there's been mating. Usually mating happens near the nest that's going to be used. As well, which is less cause to rejoice, is that there's been a quick sighting up high in the valley yesterday by our colleagues. And so the nest which has been built, the third one we know of for this couple, is really quite big. Statistically, when they build a nest, they tend to go there. So our goal here is somehow to get men and lamagayas to live together. That's to say we're trying to do it, to eliminate the possible disturbances linked to mankind. People might unwittingly come onto this site because it's so easy to get to. So we took the opposite approach and we tell them, look, you're entering the reproduction zone of a rare bird here. Respect it.
Voilà. Yeah, well, that's quite impressive, impressive because she's rolled in the ball and started to beat, beat her wings. Nothing to worry about. The Lama guy is getting back up. Here's the second big crow arriving. Well, there, he really got a bash from the wing, but he's not complaining. He was covered by the Lama guy's wing. Yeah, Rogis d'Henri on saint I'm receiving you. I was just to say that we're back now. Oh, well, listen up. We have an exceptional show here. We've had big crows who just attacked the lamagaya's nest with an adult who's sitting on eggs. So at the start I said that maybe they were looking for building material, since they were pulling at the wood, pulled a bit on the wall, but I think they came in close enough to maybe have the idea of bringing back an omelette for their lunchtime meal. Yeah, they wouldn't want to be away too long. But it's quite impressive. I've never seen that before. It's really impressive. And those crows have got a bit of cheek. No, up there, on the, on the overhead. Yeah. The males that we can see like those get up as big as this in this period. We're in November, over 100 kilos. So in the snow crust, they sink in, get exhausted and end up dying. Since they take a long time to cross these zones, there you can see they're struggling. If an avalanche gets triggered at this moment, well, they get carried away. That's sad for the ibex, but it's a great windfall for the lamagayas, who really benefit from these ibex carcasses during the winter. What else is good is that the hatching of the eggs comes in spring and the raising of the offspring happens just when the snow melts and reveals all these victims of winter. So you really get the impression that Lamagaya like this is prospecting over their living range, finding things out, mapping the summer areas and the wintering areas of the Ibex. So I think it has a very good idea of the places where carcasses are likely to be found. I think that sometimes it's good to go and, and be alone in the mountains with them, ready to freeze, to slog it when you move about and so on. It's a struggle walking in the snow. To go 50 meters, it takes half an hour. You wallow like a cow. You get people who are indifferent to this. You feel like bringing them here in winter conditions like this, and then people would realize that these are wild animals who can survive. Look at us, all the equipment we've got. And even so, we're not at all at ease. But they'll spend all winter here. And it's that, it's the aspect, it's the aspect of saying to yourself, well, hey, this isn't nothing. They're living, living, and that's enormous. you see them differently afterwards. We're going to stop there, we'll put up the telescope. So the objective is to have several people doing the survey from different places and linked by radio. Like that, the number of observation points is often multiplied. It's really a lot more efficient for the survey, so... So... That allows us, you see, to confirm that they're still brooding. 
All the observation is based on the fact that the adults arrive at the nest to exchange guard or to bring food. So I'm going to get on the radio and call Angèle. Hello, hello, hello. Angèle, for Etienne, are you receiving me? Yeah, Etienne, I can hear you. Look, have you seen anything else since you got there, by chance? Uh, yes, I saw the bird in the nest, and since I've seen a change of guard at 10.20, and the bird flew off towards Pitti Bargi. I lost it in the cliffs above Pitti Bargi. When you see a bird for the first time in its natural conditions, it doesn't look at all like what you expected. And during the holidays in July, that's July 2003, there were three generations which followed each other. Things moved ahead slowly. And just in the Grand Nord there, there was a bird which came out very suddenly, and it was quite low, so that seemed really very, very big. And it started to check things out, going around all the cliff faces. So there was no ice around at the time, the sky was pure blue, and we could see it sometimes against the cliffs, sometimes against the sky. Marion saw it first. We watched it for practically half an hour. Afterwards, little by little, you get used to seeing these birds, as well you're interested. But there is always that kind of attraction and fascination. And I say to myself that, well, I've already had really interesting experiences where I've seen them up very close. You keep that impression, and then each time you say to yourself, OK, I'll end up getting over this, and that never happens. I think that the day that it does happen, I'll change jobs, surely. bird from the vulture family, so it can't act as a predator, whatever animal it be. It's nicknamed Bone Breaker because it can swallow bones. It has gastric juices which have very acid pH, around one or two. And so it's practically the only species which can feed on bones and has no competitors in the food chain. It's constantly roaming its territory throughout the day, all through the year, so as to find carcasses and find food.
It knows the places where the chamois are to be found or the ibex. It may know where the avalanche corridors are. When something's really too big, it takes the end of the carcass or the bone in its claws and it goes to these rock fields, these bone-breaking areas, we call them, about which it will circle, fly above and drop the bone so it breaks on the rocks. And that's immediately quite characteristic. You see them descending a little like a dead leaf. The lamagaya lets itself fall. We imagine it's in order to best follow the bone that it has dropped and especially the debris that it causes by its breaking. You can see them repeat this 20 to 30 times in the day. Over the vast food territory, it's not unusual to meet other lamagayas. Sometimes it gets very aggressive. Here, we're at the Lamagai breeding centre, so it's the only specific breeding centre for Lamagais in the nation. Well, just to start with, there have to be two adults which tolerate each other, have been equipped and which reproduce. So all that really takes time because it's not just by putting two birds together at the age where they can reproduce that makes them reproduce. Therefore, it has to happen as naturally as possible so that it's the adults which look after the chick from the egg right the way through. It's a system set up by the Austrian vet Hans Frey because birds had to be found to be reintroduced. Both nestlings are hungry again, I think, and it's time to, to feed them. It is about four days now. And we'll look now for the weight of this bird. One hundred and seventy-two. So in one or two days we can put it back to the to foster parents because we uh, avoid hand raising. The consequence of hand raising is always a disturbance in the behavior of the dirt later. But this was the second egg of a pair and it is necessary to put it out because otherwise after hatching the nestlings would kill each other. Afterwards it's raised completely naturally. In a few months, maybe it will fly in the wild.
We work with the vet Ludovic Chenevel, who comes regularly to control the state of health of the birds. He's here now for the blood test of the bird before it's released. We're bleaching the wings. That means that we're decolorizing some feathers using a hydrogen peroxide that will represent when we see the bird in flight, a sort of barcode. It's the only species which has survived with so much complicity between different countries and people all along the Alpine Arc. I think that it can't continue in this way and that we'll end up by, I hope, succeeding one day to no longer reintroduce but just to follow reproduction. As long as the population isn't endangered, that's the essential thing. A few days before the birds fly off when they're released, they're mostly equipped with GPS or Argos tracers. There are different techniques which allow us to follow their movements, and this one has crossed the Alps, or even further. We're getting the direction, but as it's camouflaged by the vegetation, we'll have to, have to get closer. So here we can still see things moving in the nest, there. Look, especially a moving feather. So you always want it to be that, but well, really, it isn't that. What's reassuring is that it feeds regularly, but each time it's relatively a long time between each feed, so we're always asking questions. But the behavior of the parents at the feeding time clearly indicates whether the offspring is alive or not. We are here in the center of the Hohetauern National Park in Austria, in the community of Rauris, and exactly in the valley where, in 1986, were released the first young bearded vulture. So the bearded vulture project started exactly in this valley here. The bearded vulture project is a big collaboration between all the Alpine countries, so from France, Italy, Switzerland, uh, and Austria. 
My work in the Huatawa National Park is coordinating the monitoring and doing the releases. The breeding pair breeding here in this valley uh, has a chick. The chick is about two and a half months old. It's the first pair breeding in Austria. So since many, many years, I was really enthusiastic for this species. And uh, each time you see them, it's absolutely incredible how they are flying. The most important uh, species of raptor that lived uh, in the Alps uh, are uh, represented by golden eagle and the birded vulture. Stelvio represents a special case of uh, coexistence uh, for the both species. Since uh, the first uh, settlement uh, of the first pair of birded vulture in Stelvio National Park, uh, the general opinion about uh, him was uh, uh, nice and uh, attractive for the wingspan, very, very huge, and for uh, the behavior to uh, fly above uh, houses, village and grass are uh, all factors that shocked the local population, shocked positively. Climbers, I'd say we're the first to get the benefit because they go past our ears regularly under the climbers when we're on the face. We're not on our own territory. We're here. We're entering the territory of someone else or of several others. So it's up to us to manage that with a minimum of intrusion. You can do anything, but not just anyhow. And that's all, really. You can't destroy everything. Once again, it's a question of preservation of zones of liberty, which we've enjoyed over decades, for the benefit of future generations. There you are. Well, then, that's the other adult coming to the nest. Ah, he's perched beside it. So, 11.22, he arrives and perches 30 meters from the nest. We can see the chick on the nest, but it's not moving. Uh, it's true that the lemagaya is a bird that is quite absorbing. When you've seen it once close up, well, afterwards you're hooked. 
We're managing now to have the whole network, to be able to communicate with the valley, to have a network of people who are involved in the survey, who regularly send their information about their sightings of Lamagayas in the mountains. And all that's very useful for following them, detecting the size of their territories where a new couple has settled, spotting marked birds that can be in the area. In our role as monitoring rangers, we go every day into the Alpen terrain. Every time we can, we go and meet with the farmers. We talk to them about wild vultures, the lammergeiers. We explain to them the differences, their feeding behavior. It's really important to be in contact with these people. For the farmers, it's a help, you see. They're the knackers. All these carrion birds recycle organic matter. It's really difficult with a group, between the lammergeiers that don't want to come by and those that go by very high up in the sky, it's rather complicated to, for the kids to see them. There are no lammergeiers. Yes, there are. Where? It's weird. I see all fuzzy with this. Look at the Lamagaya page. There was a teaching pack that was made for uh, in the program Life a while back now. With um, there was a model of a bird which was life size and silhouettes of birds of prey to compare their shapes. He's behind a tree. He's gliding. He's turning there. He's coming towards us. There. Oh, yes! I can see him! Oh, yes! A bit lower. A bit lower? Can you see it or not? I've got no binoculars! I can't see it! In any case, it's really nice to watch the sunrise, daybreak, the wall creepers singing. So here we're on the Via Ferrata of Pesi, and here, well, there's nothing else to do but wait till it wants to do a turn around so as to maybe change the guard. So, well, you have to be patient. We might also help to see the royal eagles that might be in the area and which could eventually get involved with the Lamagaiers. And it's above all because of the eagles that we have to hide. Because the Lamagaiers tolerate humans quite well, whereas the eagles are a lot more suspicious. We must be very discreet. In this picture, we can see that it's bringing something for the chick. So we thought it would come towards us afterwards, so as to drop it off against the cliff and break what it has in its claws there. It passed not far from us and went back to the nest. So that was really great. All the same, it's lots of days, many hours spent waiting, watching, seeing the Lamagaya from a long way off.
C'est peut-être un peu l'effet. Euh, this is perhaps the negative side of this big reintroduction program. It's that, well, you get the impression that it's not as serious as that making a species vanish because in the end you can reintroduce it with no problem. Well, that there's no problem. That's far from certain. You can see that well enough. We have we haven't yet many couples reproducing in the Alps. Each time a chick is born, it's important because that's the future of the population. Everything which has an anthropic cause, we can attempt to do something about it. At least those causes that led to it vanishing from the Alps, that is to say fear and destruction, destruction by man. For the rest, that's up to nature. What will be, will be. Oh, there comes a moment where the parents have had enough of the chick in the nest. We have a tendency to say perhaps they want it to get a little hungry and then it'll want to come out. So first flights, they're quite impressive. Often it's a parachute flight, which means that they tend to lose height rather than to gain it. And the first landing is rather acrobatic. It rarely happens in the way you'd want it. It means that the moment there's activity, everyone's very absorbed by that activity. The little one beats its wings, humps in the nest, here we go, it's going to leave. And in fact, we've never seen them leave like that. Nothing happens. And if you're not vigilant, it does two little jumps and throws itself into the void. But we've often seen that the moment the young one takes off, the parents are there straight away, present. I went up one morning alone. It was in summer and it was fine, but there was a lot of wind. I saw a lamagaya very, very low in the valley. The more time passed, the more it advanced and the higher and higher it got, to end up almost at my altitude. In fact, he kept coming. And then at one moment he stopped. And you see, he was too big in my binoculars. So I took off the binoculars and he was right in front of me. And I couldn't tear my eyes away from his. At that second I said to myself, you have to count Henri, because he was molting on his right wing. And I said to myself, this is the moment to know which feather has fallen. And I couldn't, I couldn't stop looking at his eyes. And when he had left, I said to myself, now he's gone, count the feathers, count the feathers. And I never could count the feathers. 